Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining. And Hannah, I so appreciate that introduction. You did a wonderful job. Um, like Hannah said, my name is Sarah. I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher working with Juniper Gardens Children's Project. And I've been fortunate enough to also work with uh, Hannah's team and setting up this ECHO presentation and have also been helping with um, modifying the OASIS curriculum into the Spanish version. So I'm very excited to be presenting to this group, very eager to hear from all of you. And I'm so excited that we have such a diverse group of folks on, on this call. So like Hannah mentioned today, I'm gonna to be talking about healthy contingencies and different healthy behavioral practices. And this is part of a two-part ECHO series. So today I'm gonna to be predominantly focusing on preventative strategies and some different tools that we can use to prevent challenging or problematic behavior and the escalation of more severe challenging behaviors. And uh, as Hannah mentioned before, there are lots of opportunities throughout for some like programmed questions, but if at any point you have any questions or want to have a discussion, please feel free to unmute yourselves and interrupt throughout. So I first wanted to go over what behaviors are. There's a lot of folks on this call, so I want to make sure that we have some common terminology that we're using throughout and talk a little bit about why people commonly engage in behaviors. So people engage in behaviors every, every single day. They can be appropriate or inappropriate, and it really all depends on sort of the context, right? So you might have an appropriate behavior that looks something like someone saying, excuse me, can I have X, Y, or Z? And that's phenomenal, especially with a lot of the folks who we work with um, across all of our, our various disciplines it's always better to see someone engaging in those appropriate behaviors rather than engaging in an inappropriate behavior like hitting someone, right? I think we can all, all agree on that, right? But even though the example that I just gave is an appropriate response, you might start to see someone engage in that response 20, 50, 100 times and saying, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Well, what initially started off as an appropriate behavior now is occurring you know, at a really excessive level. And so now that might be inappropriate. So I want to start to kind of demystify or break apart what folks might initially think of as an inappropriate or challenging behavior and give you kind of a different perspective that it doesn't have to just be the severe um, escalating instances of problem behavior. It can also be something as simple as excessively or repeatedly asking for something, right? Now, in both of those examples, they really help give, give a little bit more information about why behaviors occur. And there are lots of different reasons, so let's, let's dive into them. Um, so based on really extensive research on the assessment and treatment of challenging behavior, we know just a few, a few things, and by a few things, I mean a, a lot of things, about why people engage in both these appropriate and inappropriate or challenging behaviors meaning how these behaviors are shaped up, so how they come about to be, and how they're maintained or how they occur over long periods of time. So these common reasons are referred to as common functions or reinforcers for problem behavior. So if you hear me say the term function, or like you saw in the poll before, if you see that, that term function listed, um, or if you hear me say that something is maintained by a, a, a reinforcer or some reinforcing consequence, that's what I'm describing. So the process of how a behavior is shaped up, how it, how it starts to occur, those building blocks, and how it continues to occur over time. Now, the majority of problem behavior happens for two reasons. And we'll, we'll get into all the nitty gritty with it, but I want us to have some, some initial anchor points. So the main two reasons are to get something that someone wants or to get out of something unpleasant or non-preferred. So when we're talking about that, that first category of trying to get access to something that you want, um, that might include things like attention or preferred items and activities. And when we're referring to that second category in terms of trying to get out of things that a person might not like, that might look like avoiding or trying to get out of a task or an activity, something that might be non-preferred or especially a difficult task. 
Um, and another one that I think oftentimes gets forgotten about is that interactions can also be non-preferred or unpleasant for some people as well. So based on these common functions or common reasons that we just talked about for engaging in challenging behavior, we know that there are some antecedent events or some preventative strategies um, that we're going to be talking about today. So whenever I'm talking about antecedent events, what that's referring to is some event, think of like a setting event, something that triggers or evokes um, the likelihood of challenging behavior occurring. So let's get into some of these common reasons a little bit, a little bit deeper. So when folks are not getting adequate high quality attention, that could definitely be a, a trigger, a setting event, an antecedent event that may increase the likelihood of challenging behavior occurring so that they can get access to attention that they're not receiving. Um, also, if they don't have access to high quality engaging or preferred items and activities, that might be another reason. And then when, um, whenever they're faced with a difficult or non-preferred situation, such as a task, or again, th those interactions, um, or whenever they're asked to transition from a preferred to a non-preferred task or interaction. So thinking about like, if you're, you know, watching your favorite show on Netflix, for example, you're really into it, you're ready for that next episode to come on. And someone tells you, hey, I need you to go do the dishes. And you're like, really, I, I really don't want to do that. That can be a difficult transition for some. So I'd love to hear from all of you quickly. Feel free to unmute yourselves or share in the chat if I'm able to have access to the chat. If not, Hannah and Raneem, if you'll shout those out for me. Um, I'd love to hear from all of you and see if you've encountered or noticed any of these antecedent or setting events occurring before challenging behavior in your areas of work, your practices, home life, work, any anything like that. I would love to to hear from some of you. What's the question? So the question was, um, if you've noticed or if you've encountered any of these setting events or antecedent events that are mentioned on the slide occurring before some challenging behavior or before like behaviors have escalated in your lines of, of work. We have a couple people in the chat. Lou Jane said a parent on their phone while child wants to play or wants attention. That's a great. Great Someone one. else mentioned gaming is huge for teenagers for home life. Absolutely. Gaming is a huge, huge one that I'm seeing as well. I'm transitioning from being really engaged in a game, especially on electronic devices and needing to go transition to something, especially they don't want to do lots of activities of daily living. Brushing teeth is a really big one, getting dressed and things like that. But gaming is a, a huge one. And then Linda, exactly what you just mentioned, difficult, um, non-preferred tasks, switching from homework and social events, that can absolutely be, be challenging. Anne mentioned students eloping class during a particular academic skill they're struggling with. That is an absolute huge one. I love these, these examples. And then um, I'm, if Sulana, if I'm mispronouncing your name, please, please correct me. Um, immunization avoidance is huge. I'm so happy that you brought that up. Um, that is particularly evident with, um, I've worked with folks across the, the lifespan and those who are diagnosed with disabilities as well as those without disabilities. And um, when we're working with a lot of adult individuals with, with disabilities, um, a lot of oftentimes we'll see immunization avoidance and avoidance or difficulty with um, different health behaviors, um, whether it's like medication adherence or even wearing a blood pressure cuff and things like that. So hopefully there's some some strategies that you can uh, find helpful for, for your lines of work. These are all wonderful. Nice. Thanks, everyone. All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, these preventative strategies. So 
given that we know that some of these antecedent events that we just talked about may evoke some of those challenging behaviors, there are some antecedent, or again, I really want to focus on using the word preventative strategies, because I think it's such a really robust, robust term um, that we can implement to address and prevent um, from those challenging behaviors from occurring or even escalating further. So again, I want to reiterate that these are preventative strategies. So these should occur before problem behavior happens in the the second part of our ECHO series, we'll be focusing on some strategies that we can use to respond to challenging behavior. So after the behavior occurs, but today we're really going to focus on what we can do to prevent those challenging situations from even happening. And the other thing I want to mention is that these are preventative strategies, and so they are not foolproof by any means. Um, I'm sure that the folks from the health department can attest to how wonderful preventative medicine is. And we have lots of wonderful strategies in that arena as well. Um, but despite having great strategies in that line of work as well, folks can still get sick and need additional care. So think of it kind of the same, the same way with these preventative strategies. That being said, when we use these preventative strategies consistently, they can really help curb the occurrence of problem behavior and prevent it from, from happening. So let's discuss some of these common preventative strategies as well as how we can actually use them, when to use them, and go over some examples and scenarios for each of them. And before I go further, any questions? I'm not seeing any in the chat so far, but please feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions throughout. So first, I'd like to talk about our preventative strategies to address attention. So when folks are trying to get access to, to attention. So we want to use these preventative strategies because they often help to promote healthy relationships. They can increase appropriate behaviors and they can decrease inappropriate or challenging behaviors as a way to get access to, to attention. So what, what do these preventative strategies even look like? So we want to really be focusing on providing high quality attention and interaction and different types of attention as well. So a few of those might include things like conversation. So talking to the person who we're working with um, or who we're uh, interacting with about what they're doing, what they did earlier in the day, things that they like to do or things that they might like to do. And conversation might look a little bit different based off of who you're, you're interacting with and their different ability levels as well. So if you have questions about how to adapt any of these for your um, different lines of work or the people who you're interacting with, please reach out and let me know or unmute yourselves. Um, another strategy that you can use is to just comment and compliment on the things that they're doing. So really acknowledging what they're doing can really go, go a pretty long way. So uh, for example, if someone is trying something new, trying something that's creative, they're being helpful, they're sharing, doing something kind, um, if they're having a hard time doing something, a few of you mentioned difficult tasks or um, avoiding immunizations or things like that. If you see that they're attempting to do it, this is a really great time that you can comment on that and tell them, hey, so appreciate you trying to do this. Um, thanks for trying this out. This is really hard. I know that it's that it's hard. Look at how well you're doing this. The third one is descriptive praise, which is kind of what I was doing towards the end. And it's similar to the comments and compliments, but here we really want to focus that, we, that we're that we saying something that is specific about what they're doing. So giving them specific shout outs um, with things that you'd like to see them continue doing. So, hey, thanks so much for cleaning up. You're playing so nicely. I appreciate you talking to me. Thanks for keeping your blood pressure cuff on. Um, great job having your pulse ox on your hand. All of those are great examples of descriptive praise because you're explaining exactly what it is that they're doing that you want to see them continue doing in the future. The fourth one is eye contact and pleasant facial expression. So whenever we're engaging in these different interactions with, with people, we want to make sure that we have a pleasant facial expression and that we're making eye contact or that we're at least orienting towards them whenever we're providing attention. Now, I do want to note with this one that um, for some individuals, eye contact may be challenging, 
um, or it may not be culturally appropriate. So use your best judgment given the situation, and it may be better to orient yourself towards that person rather than focusing on eye contact if that's not something that is culturally appropriate or appropriate given, given the context as well. The fifth one is greetings. So much like today when we all saw each other on Zoom, we all said hello to one another. So make sure that when you see someone, greet them. Just a good social social nicety that also helps to model some of those interactions with the individuals who we are working with um, and helps to facilitate relationship building as well. The sixth one is expressions of care. So checking in with them to see how they're doing, particularly if they look sad, tired, upset, need help, or maybe they're um, acting in a way that's not consistent with how they've acted in, in the past. Um, so saying something like, hey, it looks like you need trouble. Do you need some help? Um, it looks like that hurts. Do you want me to loosen this? Or do you need some help taking this off? Things like that. And then the seventh and last one is preferred and appropriate forms of physical attention. So we want to make sure that when we are providing physical forms of attention, that they are appropriate and consensual. So these, this might include some, some things like pats on the back, high five, thumbs up, or hug. But again, this is really going to depend on the person and the unique situation and the various areas in which you all work in. Um, this might not be appropriate for, for everyone. Um, but I saw someone who mentioned that they are working in the school. So things like a high five might be, might be good to go. Um, and even in the health fields, you know, placing your hand on someone's shoulder might be appropriate, but jumping in and giving someone a hug might not be appropriate. So again, use, use your judgment. These are just guidelines and different examples of strategies and ways that you can provide different forms of, of attention. Um, but it's going to be really important to learn the specific preferred types of attention that the person that you're working with enjoys. And again, this will just help to build better relationships with this person as well whenever you're taking their preferences into consideration. So I know that we have a very uh, diverse audience with us today, and I'd love to hear some different ways that you might be able to figure out how the person you're working with is enjoying the type of intent of attention that you're you're delivering. So how might you get to know them? How can you tell if they're enjoying the type of attention that you're providing? You can unmute yourself or respond in the chat. Love that. Tone and body language are absolutely great ones. You can definitely tell if you're, you know, engaging in conversation with someone and they start to, you know, turn away from you. Maybe they're not responding. More participation in class is a great one as well. Facial expressions. Awesome. These are all really fantastic. Yeah, I love the participation in class one as well, um, because the better rapport you have with with that student, um, the more likely they are to participate, maybe feel feel comfortable. And if you're reciprocating that attention as well, then they're likely to participate, maybe learn more in class as well. Fantastic. Any questions before we move on? Awesome. Okay. So these preventative strategies are fantastic. Um, and the recommendation is that we use them really as often as possible. So whenever you're with the individuals who you're working with, try to use these as much as possible, um, particularly for the school setting or congregate care settings or clinic type settings. Um, it's really helpful if you're providing these different types of attention about every five to 15 minutes, somewhere within that range, um, particularly whenever you see someone engaging in some appropriate behavior or attempting to engage in some appropriate behavior. So some of those examples that you gave about transitioning between um, preferred to non-preferred tasks, if you see someone who typically struggles in that, in that context, trying to you know go on and, and switch over to doing their homework after playing a video game, and you see that they're kind of struggling, acknowledge that, give them, give them a shout out. Um, 
or if someone has a hard time sitting in the doctor's office before they get their um, immunizations, acknowledge that they have, you know, come into the room, comment on how they're doing, just engage in some conversation with them as well. Um, so the goal with these preventative strategies to address attention, um, the goal really here is that we're using these often and consistently so that the individual is getting attention for those appropriate behaviors rather than only receiving attention when they're engaging in some challenging behavior. So what you want to do is try to offset that, that imbalance, right? So you want to focus your, your energy and quite literally giving your attention towards those appropriate behaviors and refrain from commenting or providing as much attention for those challenging behaviors. And lastly, these preventative strategies for attention are really going to be extremely helpful during times when you might not be able to provide frequent high quality attention and interactions. Um, this might be a good time instead to provide access to other um, preferred items and activities until you're able to engage with them. So um, in the school setting, for example, depending on the age group who you're working with, um, Maybe you're having them work on an activity with their peers, or it's time that they can read a book instead. Um, or if you're working in more of a clinic or a health field, it might look like having, having someone um, have access to maybe some of their personal devices or magazines, other media that they can kind of consume while they wait and you're filling out paperwork or preparing um, something for them. Now let's talk a little bit about our preventative strategies to address um, the category of those items and activities. So you wanna use these preventative strategies again because they help to promote those healthy relationships. They can increase appropriate behaviors that, um, when, that they might be engaging in to access those items and activities, and they can help to decrease those inappropriate or challenging behaviors to get access to items and activities. And also, for lack of a better term, honestly, um, these strategies help to prevent boredom. So I'm sure that we we all know that when there is nothing, nothing to do, people will often find things to do, and they might not always be the best the best things um, for them to be doing. So let's let's help to change that. So first, we want to make sure that we're providing access to preferred, interesting, creative, and engaging activities either throughout the day or during your time together. And by no means do these items need to be expensive or um, anything that's going to be super, super costly. We just want to keep in mind um, that individual's interests, their interests and their preferences in mind. Um, and there are some situations when we might be able to have some really um, preferred items in, involved in what we're doing and other times when we might not have, have the resources to do that and we can just have activities or items that are just freely available. Um, second, it's really important that we offer choices with different things that they can do like activities or items um, throughout the day, especially during downtimes or again, like I mentioned earlier, whenever you're busy and you're not able to provide lots of attention, um, being able to offer choices of what they can do instead is really helpful. Um, and this also helps to give that individual some autonomy, help develop their independence, and prevent them from, again, getting bored when they have nothing else to do. Um, or if they've maybe been interacting with the same item for a long period of time, um, offering some choices would be helpful. Now, granted, I know someone mentioned in, in the chat the video games um, and things like that with devices. Most of the the people we work with, I'm sure we can all agree that they probably don't get as bored whenever they're playing on a tablet. But if you think about it with a tablet or electronic devices, oftentimes there are lots of built in options within it, right? So if you're watching something on YouTube, you can quickly toggle over to another app and play a game on it instead. And there are so many different free apps on there as well. So with a tablet, it might take them a little bit longer before they get bored and want want something else. Um, but even if they're really engaged with one app, you can also remind them that they have other options as well. So we want to use these preventative strategies again as often as possible whenever you are with these, these individuals. 
but especially during downtime to prevent boredom and whenever you're busy and can't engage with them. Um, another time when this might be really helpful is um, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but during some of those difficult situations as well. So um, in order to kind of increase some adherence to those healthcare routines, um, access to items and activities might be a really effective strategy in those in those contexts as well. Um, so the goal here is that we're using these strategies again often and consistently so that the individual is engaged and they're doing things that they like um, so that they're not only being offered activities whenever they're engaging in challenging behavior. So oftentimes what you'll see is right when the, the person who you're working with is engaging in probably challenging behavior at its most severe form, that's when um, they'll be offered what I like to call kind of like this buffet of options of, okay, how can I make this stop here? Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? Instead, we want to offer those items before it ever even gets to that point, because if they have something that they're doing, something that they're engaged with, we can also incorporate those attention, those preventative strategies for attention and provide compliments, praise, and things like that as well. Any questions or comments here? All right. So um, I think this will probably be the most helpful category given given the audience. So please feel free to interrupt um, and ask lots of questions here if you have any that are kind of specific to your areas of work. Um, but I want to spend a bulk of, of, of some time with um, talking about these preventative strategies to address difficult situations and non-preferred tasks so that they can be less aversive, um, hopefully more preferred. That might be a lofty goal for some, um, but maybe the goal is to make the situation a little bit more tolerable over time. So again, if we're using these strategies, we're really trying to program in that um, decreasing that motivation to engage in some challenging behavior or avoidance behavior to get out of that situation or task. Because if you're providing access to these different things freely, then there really isn't, there shouldn't be a reason to, to try to engage in, in behaviors to get, to get out of it. So um, we want to use these, these strategies to decrease the difficulty of the task or the situation, maybe inc increase compliance or adherence to some routine, um, healthcare intervention, increase tolerance, and again, decrease those, those challenging behaviors. So first things first, we want to make sure that we are using simple and clear instructions. So for some individuals, it's really helpful if you break down complex or lengthy instructions into smaller and easier to follow steps. Um, we want to make sure that we're using a pleasant tone of voice and facial expression whenever we are presenting instructions, tasks, um, chores, or whatever that difficult context is. Um, I'm, I keep thinking back to the, the healthcare routines as well. You can imagine if someone is kind of afraid of, of getting their, their immunizations and then they walk into a room and someone is kind of unpleasant or um, is telling them, you know, really sternly like, sit down, you need to, you know, give me your arm and things like that. That might make the entire situation more aversive and more stressful for that, for that individual. So using these strategies might help make the situation a little bit less, less aversive, a little less, less daunting as well. Um, so whenever you are presenting an instruction, it's also important that we phrase them as do statements so that you're telling the individual what to do rather than using don't statements. So again, whenever we're using these do statements, it also allows you to use directives or direct instructions rather than asking them to do something. So um, whenever you're asking someone to do something, I know that it's something that we do in our everyday lives, usually asking someone, hey, do you mind doing this for me? Um, hey, can I go ahead and do this? And it's just kind of how we how we interact with one another. Um, however, when we're working with different different individuals, unless what you're asking is a true request and you are in a position where receiving the response of no is okay, then um, we want to instead ask them, you know, tell them what to do, use those do statements. Because whenever someone says no, it's really important that 
that is honored. And again, we're helping to build a trusting relationship um, that they learn that whenever they say no, that that's going to be something that's that's honored. Um, so again, unless you're asking uh, something that is a request or an actual favor, refrain from phrasing your instructions as questions. Instead, you can say things like, hey, please hand me your coat. Hey, please use your, your pen or your marker. Um, instead of, hey, would you please write using your with with your pencil or hey uh, please don't leave your your coat on the floor or don't don't put your arm like that you want to use some do requests instead. So on the next slide, I have a few examples and some different scenarios that we can take a look at. Looks like someone has. Alice said, "Absolutely, asking a question means offering a choice, and the choice needs to be honored." Absolutely agree. Thanks, Alice. So these are some examples of do versus don't requests or statements. So um, a really big one that I see a lot is brush, telling, telling caregivers to rephrase their instructions to be, hey, brush your teeth instead of stop playing with your toothbrush. Um, another one might be, hey, please put your toys away or please put your schoolwork away instead of can you clean up your toys or can you put away your, your school materials away? Um, please sit at the table, or maybe it's, hey, please sit up on the exam table instead of stop leaving the table or stop running out of the classroom or something like that. The next one might be, hey, please walk over or please come over here instead of don't run or don't leave the classroom like someone mentioned with elopement leaving, leaving the classroom. Any questions on these? Okay. Um, so these are just kind of a, a starting point. By no means are these exhaustive in any way, but I would love to hear if you all have any other examples that are applicable to you in your lines of, of work, some different instructions that you typically you typically are, are delivering throughout the day. And judgment-free zone. So even if you are using questions or don't statements, I'd love to see those in the chat so we can talk about how we might be able to rephrase them instead. I, um, this is Alice. I just want to share. I see a lot because I work with a lot of parents and uh, some parents, even though we work with them and try to have them, you know, use direct instruction, but sometimes they add, like, for example, brush your teeth. Okay. <laughs> so they tend to add something at the end, a kind of you know, make it a question again. So that's just one thing that I noticed, uh, some common uh, way to make a mistake, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great one that I, I, I see a lot as well, Alice. Um, someone said, I like letting the child know they have a choice, but still within the request. So it's time to go home. Do you want to skip to the car or sit in the stroller? That one is fantastic. And we're actually going to be going over some of those in just a second and the type of um, the way that you phrase that I absolutely love. Um, so you can absolutely embed choices and I highly recommend doing that. Um, so you're still telling them what to do, but giving them some, some options within. That's fantastic. Awesome. Okay. So let's get into some of those. So um, kind of already gone over those those simple and clear instructions. So let's look at that second one of setting some rules and expectations prior to those difficult tasks and situations. Um, so you can use if then or first then statements to establish those boundaries by telling them exactly what they're going to do and what will happen next. Um, so kind of like the one that that you just gave of, hey, it's time for us to go home. This is what you can do. Um, hey, if you finish your homework sheet, then you can watch TV or first we're going to drop off your brother, then you can go to your friend's house. Um, and then we also want to, the third one is make that instruction task or situation more fun and more engaging. And a few of you in the chat have already started to get the ball rolling on this and they're great examples. So you can provide choices like one of you mentioned. Um, so giving options for how the task is completed, what materials they can use, or even the order in which they complete their tasks. So if it's, you know, time to go to the car, 
Do you want to go to the car by skipping? Do you want to sit in the car? Do you want to go to the stroller? Um, if it's something like um, a chore, maybe it's, hey, do you want to unload the dishwashers, take out the trash, or take a shower? Which one are you going to do first? Um, and then the next one that someone said was make a fun sing song, like a pickup song, cleanup song, engaging with them. Absolutely. Um, that's going to be one of the ones that we talk about here with the non, we call those non-directive prompts. Um, so this is especially helpful um, with younger kids, school age kids, um, or honestly, really anybody, if you're able, if you're really creative enough, honestly, um, that you can provide those instructions, still using really simple, clear instructions, telling them what to do, but phrasing them in a fun way, a silly way, um, make it a game. So um, I love the the cleanup song is a great one. Also um, making it a race or competition. So let's see who can pick up blocks the fastest or um, when I was in the preschool classrooms, we would oftentimes like pretend that we had like binoculars on and we would look to find all of the red pieces of the toys first, put those pieces away. Then we'd use our binoculars and look for the blue pieces and things like that. Or um, if we we're in the school kind of transitioning between classrooms, we might pretend to walk really, really quietly or carefully like super spies and things like that. Um, so there's tons, tons of different examples and ways that you can kind of embed those in as well. Um, you can embed them into preferred activities. You can use preferred items. You can give them lots of options like what color pencil do you want to use or what kind of marker do you want to use on your worksheet or playing music while they clean up or on the drive to school or while they're doing different healthcare routines as well or um, different activities of daily living like brushing teeth, hygiene related routines as well. Um, and we can provide access to those high preferred items and activities for, again, engaging or attempting to engage and complete the task. So really important that we reinforce or reward both those successes and attempts, especially when something is difficult. How, you know, how hard would it be? Can you imagine if, you know, you're really struggling with something and no one tells you anything, no one helps you out, and they only make a comment when you've finally completed it, but maybe it's taken you a really long time to do that. And having some help along the way would have really helped really. So um, you can also provide help. And there are lots of different ways that you can do that. Um, one of the most common is telling them what to do and showing them what to do. So let's talk a little bit more about prompting and using this, this strategy. So when someone doesn't follow the instruction that you provided, sometimes you might just need to change your instruction and rephrase it. So maybe you initially presented the instruction in a way that was too complex or too lengthy. So you might just need to simplify it, or maybe it needs to be simplified further and broken down into smaller, more consumable steps. Um, you might also need to show them how to complete the step or how to complete the instruction that you've given them. And don't be afraid to jump in and provide assistance if you notice that someone is is struggling with with something. And then I'd love to spend some time talking about just a few general general tips that I've noticed um, across all the different positions i've I've held in my uh, in my professional life. Um, a big one is to avoid bribing. So, using rewards to stop challenging behavior or bargaining about rewards. Um, this is something that I feel like people have a big light bulb moment with. Um, we want to make sure that whenever we are offering these choices, we're doing it before the challenging behavior has happened. So once the challenging behavior has happened, that's not the time to again be offering that menu of, hey, do you want to play with this? How about this item? Um, oftentimes in the moment, it feels like that's effective because it stops the, the challenging behavior in its tracks. But in the long run, what you're doing is teaching that person that they don't need to ask appropriately. They don't need to do anything appropriately to get access to those items. Instead, they can engage in that challenging behavior, maybe at its most intense or severe form. And that's when the red carpet rolls out for them. And that's when they get lots of options. So instead offering that early on and refraining from providing those choices once they are engaging in, in those challenging behaviors. 
um, one that's come up consistently across all the strategies and in the chat as well is providing lots of choices throughout the day. Um, whenever possible, choices are important. People like having an input into what they're doing, how they're doing it. So offer offer those those choices and have that collaborative relationship and collaborative discussion whenever possible. Again, using those do statements, really, really helpful. Um, give small rewards often. So you don't have to wait a whole week before someone earns something. It can be something small, you know, something as simple as a compliment or a praise statement or, you know, today being being Halloween for those of you who, who celebrate or have kids or know people who have kids. I'm sure everyone is going to be getting lots of small candies today. That's a great example. You can give someone a small a small treat if you're working with them. Again, that might not be applicable for all of the members who are, who are joining the call today, um, but there are some other forms of attention and other strategies that we've talked about that I think would be applicable in those in those uh, situations. And then one that I want to talk about as well is that um, reprimand. So a lot of times you'll see people say things like don't do that or stop doing that. That's still a form of attention. And if someone hasn't been receiving attention for a long time, then even that reprimand on its own might still be reinforcing that behavior because they're still getting that need or that want met. So be be kind of cautious with, with those reprimands as well. Um, and not saying never, ever, ever use them, but what I'm saying is that you want to make sure that you're using more of those positive interactions, those preventative strategies for those appropriate behaviors, because there are some individuals who we've worked with where reprimands are extremely effective for stopping really severe, dangerous behaviors. But if your only interactions with that person are only ever reprimands, then they're not going to be effective, right? So we wanna make sure that we're using those preventative strategies a lot more, thinking about it like, as a proportion, you want your proportion of those positive interactions to be significantly greater than um, any negative interactions or reprimands. Great. And then I have a few scenarios that we can kind of talk through together as a group. Um, and then for the sake of, of time, if folks have other questions outside of these scenarios, please feel free to, to jump in. But um, I'd like to, based off of our, our audience, let's talk about these first two scenarios. So in the first one, Renee has difficulty following instructions to put on his coat before going to play outside. Whenever his therapist, maybe his, his teacher or another professional tries to get him to put on his coat, he throws his coat and screams no. So based off of our conversation today, what antecedent strategy might be helpful to increase the likelihood that Renee puts on his coat without engaging in some of those challenging behaviors? So think back to some of those strategies that we talked about to decrease difficult situations. What might be something that we could potentially do in this situation? so that putting on his coat isn't, isn't so challenging. Speaking, maybe giving options, kind of like you said before, choices of, we're about to leave. Do you wanna put your coat on first or your shoes on first? That's a great one, Hannah, absolutely. So you can definitely give, give choices, offer help, um, even, presenting it in a really fun or creative way, like someone had said earlier, um, with songs, kind of making it silly, making it a race, things like that. Any other ones that folks can think about? Okay. Then let's talk about the second one with Anton. So Anton often paces and, um, let me go back to the chat really quick saying that they agree about giving the choice absolutely so right. seeing if um if one kiddo can put on their coat first so if you have multiple kids in in an area seeing who can put it on the fastest um 
putting it on in a silly way, things like that are all great options. Awesome, thanks. So with the second one, Anton often paces and wanders around the center. They seem to be bored with the activities offered, resulting in some social isolation and making negative comments to their peers. So what antecedent strategy might increase the likelihood of positive interactions and activity engagement for Anton and kind of prevent him from, from being bored and withdrawing from others? I would be interested in hearing from people who maybe are working as like case managers or social workers and kind of how they would approach this in their scenario, if anyone is willing to share. Um, over here, we see a lot of the behavior analysis standpoint, but I'd love to hear another perspective. Yeah, I'd love to know if there are any any strategies that you use, if there are ways that you kind of see this in terms of these behaviors manifesting as maybe anxiety and how you can kind of reduce some of those symptoms of of anxiety if the if you know in this example with Anton, if he's pacing because he's bored or if he's um, withdrawing from peers because of another reason, what strategies you might use as well. So if no one wants to speak up, Sarah, I was wondering if you could maybe walk through how you would Address handle it. a situation. Maybe let's say Anton is coming in and you're a caseworker and he's coming in with his family and he's showing this sort of behavior. Like what would your recommendation be to increase the positive interaction and engagement? Absolutely. So if um, Anton were um, coming into my office and I see that they're really not interacting with the items that we have, they're really withdrawing from their family, I would want to first greet them, thank them for coming, um, maybe comment on something that they're wearing, talk a little bit about what I'm doing, kind of narrating what I'm doing, helping to make them feel a little bit more comfortable. So maybe they're also pacing around in the room because they're not sure what I'm doing or the purpose of, of being there. So I might introduce myself, say, hey, today we're going to be doing this, kind of give them a little bit of an agenda, tell them what, what I'm doing, describe what I'm going to be doing with their parents or their family members who are present, um, let them know that they have some options available in the room. Maybe they're also pacing because even though they see the items, maybe they're not interacting with them because they're not sure if they have permission to engage with those items. So it might also be helpful to let them know that they can take a seat, they can play with these items or ask them if there are other things that they would like to talk about or other things that they would like to interact with instead. Um, maybe if it's a family session, if it's something that um, I'm gonna be talking with the parents for a little bit first and maybe Anton doesn't need to be involved, I might first make sure that Anton has something that he's doing and that they feel comfortable doing before working with, with um, caregivers. Also asking caregivers for their input as well um, and see if there are ways that we can all be interacting together. We offered up a really great one. Choice in activities, offer ways for him to be active within the group, absolutely. So um, and giving, giving those options um, and seeing if there's something that they can do. And then someone else had also uh, uh, said that maybe giving a preferable task alongside the one that's difficult, maybe letting him pace a few minutes and then try again. Absolutely. So maybe pacing is something that provides comfort for him. So it might be helpful for him to pace for a little bit and then try to approach him again, offer him some of those options inviting him to have a leadership role in the group activity from the beginning before he's disengaged. That one's a really, really creative one. I really like like that one. Um, Sarah, if you don't mind elaborating a little bit more about what that leadership role would look like for the health department, I'd love to hear 
hear more. But I think those are all really wonderful, wonderful activities. So my thought, um, I'm I'm bringing that a little bit as a, um, ah, I do Sunday school. So yeah. that's kind of where I came at with that when we would have group activities. Um, yeah. So less health department. I wanted to okay. let you guys know I'm not, um, when Hannah threw that out there, it's like, oh, that is not me. I was coming okay. to you for the health department, but yeah, that was my thought on that. Um, okay. so yeah, I love that. Definitely kind of priming them a little bit with um, how they can be involved, giving them a leadership role from, from the beginning. That might be something that's helpful and maybe, um, maybe like a large group environment might be kind of overwhelming. So if you kind of pull them aside from the beginning and talk to them, kind of giving them that leadership role, then maybe you can mentor them. And it might also um, not be so stigmatizing as well if they're kind of on on their own, but you can kind of help them throughout that that interaction. That's fantastic. Thank you all so much.